RJ Cordes is an incredible thinker. In this show, we cover a lot of ground, including RJ giving us a tour of sense-making tools. The observation that when we're exposed to ambiguity, it results in us being less likely to go back to our initial assumptions, even when better information comes along, and his research on how remote teams can work more successfully. Relax and enjoy as RJ breathlessly gives us an accelerated lesson in sense making. Hi, folks. Welcome back to the Evolving Leader Podcast. I'm Scott Allender, along with a man who once won a competition by lip syncing Ice Ice Baby, but uh, we still choose to take him seriously, Mr. John Gomes. Oh, thanks, Scott. But I didn't actually win that competition. Not, not even close. Well, that makes it even worse, doesn't it? Um, did you tear down all your vanilla ice posters off the wall after you rip no. them off your, your bedroom walls? No, they're still up. Oh, um, well, maybe in a fit of rage you would take them down. <laughs> yeah, but I should add you were in that video as well, um, doing something salacious with an ice cream. So I think uh, maybe uh, we'll... Uh, I don't remember that. Yeah, um, okay. Anyway, all right. Well, besides strolling down memory lane... How else are you feeling today? I'm feeling really excited because um, our, our guest today, I know, is going to get us thinking really hard. Um, and mm. uh, that's exactly what this show is all about. So uh, very excited. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I'm eager to speak to our guest today because I'm hoping he can uh, help me make some better sense of some of the nonsense I see going on around me. So uh, today we are joined by uh, Richard J. Cordes. Richard is a researcher focused on narrative and mimetic warfare, complex systems, knowledge management systems, and cybernetics. He founded the Cognitive Security and Education Forum and contributes research to a variety of working groups and committees across DOD, IEE, and the private sector on topics like gray zone warfare, knowledge management technology, optimization of human learning, and decentralized System. So obviously he and I spend our days doing mostly the same things. Okay. He's also published several papers, including one that he wrote last year that I found to be personally helpful called Making Sense of Sense Making, which we will cover with him today. So Richard, welcome to The Evolving Leader. Thanks. It's good to be here. Thanks, Richard. Well, let, let's dive in and let's start by making a little bit of context for our leaders. Can you give us a sense of your background and talk a little bit about your work that you're doing and, and give us a definition of sense making as well? Because that phrase may intuitively uh, be obvious to people, but not necessarily so. So, Yeah, sure. And, and first, just call me RJ. It's fine. So easier to start uh, with where I am now um, and then maybe look back a bit. So right now I'm a research fellow at the Atlantic Council and I'm on appointment to the Geotech Center as an expert on um, knowledge management as, as you explained. Um, and mostly I'm there to contribute to research and recommendations on those topics. Um, now, my real interest though is, is how we make sense of the world. So, uh, which as uh, I'll, I put elsewhere numerous times is a blessing and a curse because it lets me kind of research everything. Um, so now how I ended up there, uh, I won't give a whole story, uh, it's quite long, uh, but I'll give the rapid fire version. Um, my, my first business, my, my original, uh, I guess my first professional experience was, it was as a teenager. Um, and it was, it was an informal business. I didn't register it or anything, but, but it was, you know, sole proprietor kind of thing. Um, and I'll be very informal, uh, was using auction houses and games like world of Warcraft as investment vehicles. Um, I transitioned out of that into real markets, uh, whatever you want to call a real market, um, you know, uh, mostly trading securities that were sensitive to geopolitics and military research interests. Um, pivot one really out of that was, was converting geopolitical research into equity research. And then pivot two was figuring out ways to mine data out of crowds um, to get really like signals about the state of em emotional regulation. Um, and, 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 uh, in comparison with the knowledge of the crowd and as a basis to predict volatility. Um, really throughout all of that was, was that focus on how people make sense of things and where it breaks down um, when, when, it, when it fails to, fails to work either because of, you know, like the classics on, on the trading floors, like, you know, fear of missing out. Um, but then uh, after that, ended up leaving finance entirely uh, to go focus on education technology, because it, again, uh, really just to focus on how do we make sense of the world and how do we develop expertise. 
uh, and ended up focusing there on uh, how do you optimize human learning, one, and then two, um, how do you record um, all of that personnel data, all of that education data about the state of um, uh, people's credentials and competencies, which is a way more difficult problem uh, than I realized initially getting in. Um, so uh, under that, I, I chaired a committee uh, on, on universal learning record under uh, DO, US DOD personnel and readiness and was part of a half dozen others on, you know, other, other initiatives outside DOD and private sector. And then also in the IEEE, I'm still on a number of those. Um, and then uh, in between there also did a brief stint in e-gaming. So like online gambling. Uh, so doing the dark arts of detecting emotional regulation and creating mechanisms to control value of currency in those systems. Um, so following background, you, you wanted a, a quick explanation of, of sense making. I'll, I'll refer right back to that, that paper, which was really me taking from Carl Weick, who was, who was, you know, more or less the, the person who, who got that term into, you know, made that term common in the literature, um, which was basically saying sense-making is exactly what it sounds like. It's, it's an attempt to make sense of the world. Um, now, a lot of people will argue there. It's like, well, okay, did we really need a word for that? You know, I thought that was called thinking, you know, <laughs> uh, why, why, why have this extra layer and, and, um, uh, and when I try to think really why it's necessary to have that, that secondary term now, um, it's, it's mostly because we have some concept creep. Um, so not all thought has to do with making sense of the world. Not all cognition has to do with making sense of the world. Um, and, and, and separating it out allows us to, to kind of put it in a box and then say, well, how do we formalize this process? And then we see the derivations of, of, of terms around it. So for example, um, a lot of my current research is on intelligence analysis. And the reason I like looking at intelligence analysis is because it is the, in, at least from my read, um, the oldest formalization of sense-making. Uh, you know, you, you see, you see um, by, by 100 AD, uh, the, the Roman military had, um, I think, close to a dozen information specializations. They had more specialization. You know, everybody likes to talk like, you know, story, you hear people talk about the Roman Empire and they like talk about like all the engineering specializations. It's like, well, they, they had they had twice as many information specializations than they did engineering. Hmm. Um, you know, uh, 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 people whose only job was was um, uh, getting information from human sources, people whose people whose only job was carrying information securely, um, encoding information securely, um, archiving. And, you know, a, a lot of people would say uh, Rome's greatest feat is its roads. I would argue it was the maintenance of hundreds of thousands of records. Um, they were the first developers of library science. So um, if that helps, um, mm. uh, give, give some context for the term. And also well, defense right out of the gate. You can see how often the, <laughs> the term is attacked. <laughs> well, I like the idea of making a distinction between thinking and sense making, because thinking could be to arrive at, you know, either kind of narrow uh, problem solving, or it could be to um, defend a, a point of view, uh, you know, using your thinking to, you know, argue at your case and so on. But the the kind of recursive thinking of sense making, which is putting problems in problems, uh, mm. is is very different, and it's not something that everybody does or thinks about. Um, they might assume that their perception of the world is sense making rather than what I think you're talking about, which is the ability to challenge assumptions and look at it from multiple perspectives and create new um, pictures of, of or interpretations of, of what's going on by, by looking at it from multiple vantage points and planting problems within plot problems. Would that be an, uh, you know, a better way of thinking about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, well by, by, by separating out the term, you allow um, the opportunity to develop it into process, you know, and, and it's, and then also be able to 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 um, uh, box it in so that you can see what its outputs and outcomes are, yeah. and it's really you know so so um, a, a lot of uh, you know as 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 a, a part of looking at sense making a lot of what what I look at is is trying to understand how how teams make sense of of so it's organizational sense making is really the the focus right and it's and one of the things that comes out of there for me was really finding what I learned um, was you really need to how do I put this so like. You need to allow your outcomes to inform your process. The only way you can do that is really to, to 
um, uh, box in the process so you can see what's actually happening. So you can get to A to B relationship that you can actually, you know, start to start to measure what, what those outcomes look like. And you, you have to allow your outcomes to inform your process because your process will certainly affect your outcomes, whether you allow them to or not. Scott mentioned um, the paper where we kind of became really aware of you, Making Sense of Sense Making, which um, was written uh, in the middle of last year or published in the middle of last year and there are lots of really helpful insights and we'll we'll publish a link to it on on the uh, on the show that i think extend beyond covid what compelled you to write it and can you just talk us through some of the central takeaways from that piece of research yeah sure so um uh when when i was when i was still trading um I, I, I was a news junkie. I, I, I didn't I didn't do quant quant finance. I, I focused on 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 really um because like I said before, you know, like things that were, were sensitive to geopolitics and politics. Like so so that meant just constantly reading. Um so that was waking up um, you know, four thirty in the morning every day and just reading i could not like i i it, i'm kind of glad this is part of the reason i left um was because it's, it's just like impossible to maintain a life and then try to you know stay up to date there's just so much happening and then so many layers um to attempting to to actually figure out what's going on because there's there's perverse incentives in the writing um you know and uh uh and then also just the volume you know, let alone anything else. So many details that you're coming across. We're, we're, we're surrounded by black boxes everywhere. You know, things that we, we kind of cross over and think we might understand um, and our, our brain kind of fills in the gaps on, but we don't really understand how it works at all. And, and you know, mm-hmm. perfect example of that was Chinese securities, which is now um, finally, uh, uh, <laughs> maybe six years later, um, you know, uh, everyone t- was telling me I was, I was just more or less, uh, you know, uh, too scared. Um, but my suggestion was that it was like, these are black boxes. We don't know how they work. They don't report in the same way um, US or, or UK um, securities do. You know, to get on the FTSE or, or on, on the NYC, it's just, just totally different standards. And then all of the involvement from the government and the ability to just simply lie. And then, you know, as long as it's um, in line um, with, with what CCP is interested in, then it's, you know. So anyway, point being is it's just, there's so much structural complexity and, and so much volume out there that, even for somebody who is waking up every day with, with saying that, you know, everything else takes a backseat. This is, this is what's important to me. I ended every day thinking like, I don't, I don't know what's going on. And, uh, you know, the, I think it was like the first, the first year was like, oh, yeah, I know, I understand. And then, you know, um, what was great about uh, trading was that like you, you, get a, you get a marker at the end of every month, which is literally letting you know, like, how well are you thinking? in comparison with the market, you know? Um, so, so anyway, uh, when, when I got into ed tech and, and into that space um, where it was like, oh yeah, like, you know, how do you train people to, to make sense of the world? Um, and again, this goes back into intelligence analysis because this is an area where it's a group of people in a high reliability organization whose only job is to wake up every day and try to figure out what's going on. And they were saying the same thing in, in after 9-11 was that, yeah, it's just too much. It's too much information to make sense of. And I thought like, oh, okay, now we found it. Like, okay, I'm thinking this in like 2012, thinking like, oh, wow, you know, this insight that I have developed, that this is out of control. And it's like, no, 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 the intelligence community had this 100% 2001. We're just like, yep, no, this is too much. It, not even we can handle it. An organization of, of you know, of, of I don't know how many people in, in Five Eyes, let's consider the whole, you know, Western intelligence framework, like, you know, um, how many people in Five Eyes plus the contractors plus the private firms, like, um, and they're having trouble. Um, but then you can go all the way back. And, and this is what I ended up finding is like um, Vannevar Bush, uh, the person who uh, in the U.S. like really uh, uh, pushed for science funding and, and really like revolutionized that 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 um uh, that yeah that grant system and 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 really for pushing for scientific funding and he came out and, and basically said i think it was 1954 and put out like look like you know well and fine that we improve the sciences in all these places but if you if we don't focus on how to make sure that scientists of different specializations in these different in these different worlds between government private industry, academia, if we don't figure out the information system to make sure that everybody can keep up to date on what's relevant to them and make sure that that 
you know, in each of those specializations that they're able to then trade and update others from the other specializations of what might be relevant to them. Because every now and then something from neuroscience is pretty valuable to medicine. And, uh, you know, like uh, every now and then something that, that, that shows up in Alzheimer's research might be really valuable to memory research in general or to iron regulation or, you know, any of these other areas. So, so we saw in 1954, it's like this is already going to spin, spin out of control. So when I was looking at what was happening with COVID, and, and really, I saw an information problem. You know, I, I really, I, I mean, I saw, I saw an information problem first, and then second was, was, was a medical problem. Because, you know, uh, one, one of the uh, uh, real small tangent is, uh, again, back to intelligence analysis. They, they already developed the literature on, on, okay, yeah, how do we make sure that analysts aren't falling into pits um, and, and aren't falling into ruts? And uh, there's a person, R.J. Hoyer, uh, uh, he, he wrote um, uh, a series of papers for um, internal journals uh, for, for CIA between, you know, I th- like, uh, I don't know the years, maybe, maybe you're, I, I guess the ones I'm going to reference are somewhere in the 1970s or 80s. Um, but but uh, uh, what he did was he basically laid out like, look, these are the cognitive biases you need to be aware of. These are the problems you need to be aware of. And the one that I saw that was like most relevant um, to, to, to us in general, as a, as, a, as a Western society, was the fact that initial exposure to ambiguity, so initial exposure to like, okay, I'm not sure what's going on here. Um, maybe there's a little bit of false information or simply just misleading information greatly damages your ability to go back and make sense of it, even after better information becomes available. So, so, so just that first wave of uh, perverse interest on the part of media um, you know, try because it's ratings and, and they keep talking about it. And what ended up happening during that process is a lot of information that slipped through. Like a lot of people like to think like the disinformation problems, mostly on, on discord servers or telegram. And it's really spread across the entire society, governments included. So, so that first wave of ambiguity, and, and, and I'd argue that, that, that Trump um, in the U S was a big part of this damaged our ability to recover from it. And at each step, we just kind of, kind of just, pushed further into it, you know, until you have, you know, the, the World Health Organization, CDC, um, uh, you know, giving misleading information um, for a whole variety of reasons, you could argue noble or not, but, but we're, we're constantly further mired into ambiguity and then looking at it going, why can't, you know, why can't we just all get on the same page? And it's, <laughs> why would we? You know, so like what, all the what's, literature. What's, yeah. 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 What's, what's at the root of that, that first wave of ambiguity? And why does it create that kind of like cognitive collapse in, in people's ability to reassess what comes next? Great question. I mean, like it's question for me as well, because at first it was like, OK, well, it's just it's just like, uh, you know, this this phenomenon we can observe. And that, that, that was certainly how Hoyer handled it, which was like, OK, well, there are cogn- there are actual scientific reasons for why that occurs. And really what he focused on was like, the fact that it occurs and then what you can do about it. Um, and, and so, so I can answer more to, to what, what the response is to it. Yeah. Um, uh, cause, cause I, I would be cautious venturing into the train before it. Um, uh, one, because of, of, of my, my field of interest, what it is I, I study on a regular basis. Um, so I'd mostly just have to lean on the, the, the people that I work with that know more about those aspects. Um, so, so I'll, I'll quick give my, my initial, again, cautious take, um, which is that it has to do with trust. Um, almost all of our information gathering has to do with trust. I mean, you know, um, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a famous, at this point, um, uh, kind of uh, give and take in this, this show in America called Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Hmm. Um, and the argument that that occurs in the show is basically that it's between um, it's over evolution, I think. And um, uh, the, the person who's religious basically argues, you know, well, the Bible tells us X, Y, Z. Um, the other person was, well, well, we have, you know, uh, studies, we have data, we have all of these tomes and, you know, and you're just trusting this because, you know, uh, somebody wrote something in a book once. And you never met them. And it's like, well, have you ever met any of these scientists? Have you poured over the data yourself? Have you, you know, done? And it's like, yeah, well, it's, it's mostly faith-based. You know, it's just, obviously, it's, they're being facetious. Like, there's more to it, which is that there's layered trust. Um, so, so, which is another tangent um, I'll, I'll, I'll avoid on, on how we um, uh, basically layer 
as a basis of like trust interest, like how much we should trust a, a particular framework or, or a group of people has to do with uh, expectations about how many people we also trust trusted them, um, you know, network effects and all that. Let's hone in a little bit on on a lot of what you're saying here, but there's something that you wrote um, in this space that that really resonated with me. And you said that you know, just as a fish is blind to water until it is stressed by exposure to the surface, we are often blind to our incredible, expansive, awe-inspiring ability to make sense of our environment until we no longer can. And it feels like that's been the inflection point of of covid in many ways and and i know you you touched on a bit of that could you could you expand on what happens cognitively behaviorally in your in your observation when people can you know cease to be able to make sense of something mm. so um I'm, I'm glad i'm glad you brought that up. that's a that's a that's a good segue here um uh to that like honestly uh to like hope you know um uh mm. what what can be done because uh truly like a lot of what i'm saying might be taken as pessimistic and and the reality is, you know, a lot of these things are features, not bugs. They're actually um, our ability to make sense to the, of the world is unparalleled, mostly because of language. But but anyway, I'll look to Albert Avey on this one. Same book, um, again, philosophy review textbook, and it ends up being just just very 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 solid as a, as a resource. And what he brings up is that same thing Hoyer does, you know, <laughs> uh, almost almost a hundred years later, like ninety years later, which is that we're going to fit most things to prior models. The, the only time we don't do that is when we literally can't. Like when, when, when the, the information we're receiving literally cannot fit to any prior model. And um, I think there's, there's some research actually on like um, uh, betrayal, deception, um, where like if you want to understand why um, uh, cheating in a, in a 30 year marriage is traumatic, it's because you built, you scaffolded all of this, this information and knowledge and expectations and beliefs all on some root thing. And when that gets knocked out, everything else has to reform to some new model, which means that you now have to go over every memory between that you're going to do this automatically. The brain's going to go back over all of the events that, that, you know, that vacation you took two years ago, mm-hmm. five years ago, eight years, 10 years ago, and try to try to map it to this new space where, where this could have happened, you know? And, and I think that that's what's happening now for a lot of people um, on, let's call it both sides of, of some abstract fence on what's happening, because a lot of people are, I think, suddenly disillusioned with institutions as an abstract concept because they feel lied to or trapped. I know like the protests in France, especially um, trying to, because again, like a, lo- a lot of my at Atlantic kids, I end up focusing on, on uh, disinformation and um, uh, narrative influence. And that was, that was the last book um, I was a co-author on. It was called the narrative campaign field guide. And what we did was we were trying to look at like, okay, you know, how do you, uh, if you wanted to impact narratives um, around COVID-19, um, how would you do that with respect for what we know about behavioral change and attitudinal change? And, you know, what, what we really found was that it was like, it was, it was mostly trust problems. That was what came up like across all these things was that really, if you wanted to make any impact at all, anywhere, it's really, you, you need to come back to trust. Getting back more specifically to, to that, to that quote from, from that article. I think that it, it comes as a shock some to some people when when suddenly they can't really make sense of what's going on that they can't just externalize because most of us are externalizing most of our sense making most of the time right mm-hmm. like you know um so so when you find out you know for example that like um even even uh um i think the lancet paper was brought up in that article and it's a good example where it was like oh okay data there was fraudulent data involved and and what it does is it corrupts the scholarly canon it damages our trust in the institution as a whole. And um, yeah, it, it, can, it, can, it can be shocking, but most of the time what you find is people just withdraw. And that's really not good for uh, any democratic society. You know, if, if you can't reduce the complexity of the, the space out there, you're going to reduce the complexity of the strategy you use. That's it. Like, mm. that's it. That's, that's, the, that's the paradigm I've, I've seen. It's just that, that that's, that's 
it's that simple. If you, if you cannot reduce complexity out there by like you know, framework or, or by, by reading and, and, and information gathering, then what you're going to do is you're going to reduce the complexity of the strategy you use to go deal with it. And the, the least complex strategy you could possibly use is to just withdraw and, mm-hmm. and either just give blind trust at a certain point um, uh, which is what, what's, you know, certainly what happened after, um, uh, 9-11 and trying to understand, you know, the balance between security and privacy was, it was just like, all right, like we don't know what's going on. There's, there's so much happening that we weren't aware of. So I'm from, I'm from New York. Um, and I grew up, you know, um, uh, not, not that far from New York city. And I remember that as an event, it was, it was, you know, very, very serious. And I remember after that, that, that two years after that, it was just kind of like, there was so much news being pumped at us about terrorism, about funding, about these complex networks, and then about like, what was the government doing? What did they do wrong? Uh, were they involved? That was also, you know, uh, in there. And and unfortunately what happens is is because, you know, if it, if it gets sufficiently complex out there, okay, move up a level from simple withdrawal. And what you're doing is you're getting maintain, maintenance of con- like a continuous partial attention, which means that you never really integrate because there's so much coming at you. You know, uh, there's there's some great studies from the 80s. Uh, basically, what they found was that you can have a thing such as, called negative resources, which is that you, you get at a certain point, and they were focusing on managers, um, so particularly relevant here as, you know, leaders and companies. Um, and what they found was that giving them even good information, giving them too much information led them to make worse choices. So there is such thing as, as, as negative resources, because what ends up happening is you just go back to, well, I can't actually integrate all of this, and you just... You do continuous partial attention. You never really integrate all of it, um, which leads to a dangerous phenomenon known as just pure induction, where you know you're you're making sense of the world solely through induction. You're just you're not really consciously thinking out why you're coming to conclusions. You're just slowly forming patterns based on what comes to you, and that is the threat surface. If you want to talk about like like foreign influence campaigns, like and 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 that that realm um, of disinformation that it it lies in in structuring the patterns and induction for people. So you, you end up thinking certain ways. But then finally, um, I think uh, just to wrap up, um, uh, and this is, I think, particularly relevant in the West right now, is that one step up then from uh, just maintaining continuous partial attention is to compress and filter that information that you're receiving with what I would call an inappropriate emphasis on threat detection, which really ends up meaning, uh, and this comes directly from Hoyer, was that when you have too much information coming in and you start compressing on a basis of threat detection, one, you start getting false positives for threats. You start seeing things as dangerous that might not actually be dangerous. And then second is conspiracy, is that you see a series of actions and what happens is it's like somebody's organizing things underneath it. And we start we start assuming malintent. And now this is like, you know, look at look at Twitter. You know, it's, right. then, you know, it's it's either everyone's stupid or or um, someone actually is like uh, secretly evil or or right. selfish or they don't care or you know, etc. Yeah. So th- this all comes from a um, a series of reactions to uncertainty and overload and conflicting mm. information and so on, um, and in terms of how people engage and then how do they make sense of it, how they think. Um, when you start talking to the average person about you know the kind of language or you know the thought process of pure induction for example they'll still switch off won't they um so what what is the kind of like the the practical utility for the average person in terms of trying to navigate through the the echo chambers of division and and so on what 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 do you think you know like if you're advising you know friends and, and so on about how how to kind of orientate themselves differently to this what what advice would you give them so glad for that question because usually it ends up going in the other direction which is what is the advice for government and it's like well <laughs> you know fun i don't i don't know you know fun fun better tools um i guess um but but for average people other average people talk to people you know, like like um, uh, there was a there was a great article um, a while back. Uh, I also blanking on the author's name. Um, terrible. This opportunity to 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 get all these other people's names in here. I'm literally blanking on the name. Um, but they they wrote they wrote an article on 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 why democracy is failing in in the United States. And, and their argument was this was that was that Americans used to practice democracy, 
And and this the, the, their argument actually I think applies directly same same to 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 the UK. So um, early early um, 1900s, late 1800s, there was tons of tavern associations, church associations. There were these groups where if you were in a town, you were part of a community, you were practicing democracy on a fairly regular basis. It wasn't just going to the voting booth for for state or you know you know national elections or anything like that. It was like no 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 like. You're part of, as an adult, organizations that you're going to go and contribute to. It used to be men's clubs um, primarily, but there was women's clubs as well. Um, after the 1950s, you start to see that kind of like consolidate and and start to slowly um, fall apart. It really um, uh, goes away and then comes back in the form of in, in the U.S. Anyway, this is where I have more knowledge of it. It's, it comes back in the form of softball leagues and bowling leagues. So even my mother, like I remember, like she was a member of a bowling league and a softball league, and both had voting mechanisms. Mechanisms. Both were places where you know I remember being taken as a kid. Um, you know, and I, I'd be I'd be four years old sitting in the chair, and everybody's talking about politics. They're trying to figure things out. And right now, our mechanism for doing that is Facebook. And a lot of people felt that, oh, this is just, we're going to increase the scale. And, and it's just, you know, it's going to be the same thing. And it, it, it isn't. It just isn't. You know, it's not, a, in, in complexity science, we call it not a scale-free system. Um, you know, because so much of that is based on trust and expectations. You know, so, so um, uh, you know, giving people the opportunity to talk about politics, um, uh, you know, over Facebook uh, really is, uh, I would argue, quite similar to giving people in cars and traffic the opportunity to talk about politics, you know, like, like, you know, because you have this box around you, you're not actually, you know, directly in, in contact with the person. And, um, you know, if, if somebody were over your house, like I, I see, like, people talk to each other on Twitter, and it's like, if this person, you know, showed up to your house, and you were sitting over, you know, dinner, would you talk to them that way? Mm. You know, like, like, and, and it's absolutely not like, no, like, but, but because we put this barrier in between, um, it's just how we do, do concept create and pattern forming. We kind of stop applying that that's a human being on the other side. So if there's like an actual practical aspect, it's like, talk to other people because, because especially, especially right now, because all of us, all of us are getting most of our information over highly curated feeds. These are not organic feeds. I don't see the same world you do. So, so. If, if you if you lived in my neighborhood, we could be um, we could arguably say we're pretty calibrated. You're going to see things I don't see. Sure. And I'm going to see things you don't see. Sure. But but we could more or less get calibrated if we both heard a car crash. We both heard the car crash and we both heard it at the same time um, for hyper local news. Maybe even there. OK, well, you know, we both follow like this is local news not on Facebook. We follow like we, we go and check on this news site every day. OK, maybe we have more or less at least the same conception of, of, of what it is that's happening. Um, and then we can trade in meaning about those things. But at this point, now we live in thoroughly different worlds. So long as the world outside of our individual neighborhoods all come curated to us, then we live in functionally different worlds, worlds because of that problem of induction. The order matters. Yeah. The order matters a lot. So, so and, and also the, the um, uh, prioritization, the the um uh, uh the frequency all the stuff matters a lot so so we we do live in fundamentally different worlds and we have to calibrate outside that context so really i if there was one piece of advice i could give to everybody right now it's it's like get limit your time on twitter limit your time on facebook and start talking to other people and try to get a sense you know and asking them questions if you wanted to do um i found this insanely valuable recently so if i have a question about something i'm trying to figure something out Go to my network, you know, go and ask people. And, 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 you know, a year ago, um, I honestly, I look back and I'm like, well, what would I have been able to take that advice a year ago? You know, and the reality was kind of, I could have asked around and then got a no and then gone and looked it up. Um, so speed isn't everything. That's, that's, that's the, uh, I, I, the snippet I'd really give is that, that, mm -hmm. um, uh, speed isn't everything. Um, you know, the brain takes its time, like it's yeah. okay. We live in a society where it's, we, we expect the information to be available like that. And the reality is what we're getting back isn't always what we think it is. That's such good advice. And, um, and I, think, uh, I think the book you might have been referring to, was it Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone? Yes, 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 yes. Um, on the bowling league specifically. Yeah. Yes. We want to hear from you. Send us your leadership questions on Instagram at Evolving Leader and John and Scott will address them in a future show. And be sure you're subscribed to the Evolving Leader podcast on your favorite platforms so you catch all of our exciting new content. Thank you for listening. Now, let's get back to the show. Can we turn 
and and think a little bit or or could you speak a little bit to leadership implications and i'm specifically interested in the future of work and 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 knowledge transfer between teams and such can you can you speak about that a little bit sure um so so uh the the easiest way to frame this is how how i framed it before um is that we see a gradient of specialization over time across like the, the long arc of history. Okay, you know, like like politically, is there an arc or a bend to history? It may be debatable, um, but there 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 isn't any debate about um, how the the arc of history bends in in terms of um, uh, rate of of specialization um, in in like let's call it the knowledge economy. Uh, if the knowledge economy could be argued to exist in ancient Greece, uh, so um, you know. At the at the time, you know, and like like ancient Greece, like it would not be um, contentious to say that a single individual of of reasonable intelligence could have a, a reasonable handle over most of the the the, the relevant corpus of a given field, um, or even multiple fields. Um, fast forward, you know, to to um, uh, maybe 18th century or 19th century, um, and this starts to expand but still not insane. Uh, you, could, you could still have, uh, uh, again, a reasonable handle over uh, a number of, of, of fields. You could, you, could, you, could, you could know a decent amount of the corpus relevant to each of them. And um, uh, buried in a lot of the philosophers' work during that time, so even, even in like Hobbes, I think, <laughs> in the Leviathan, um, seems totally unrelated, but hidden in there is a um, structure of human knowledge, how to, how to spread these things out and, and, and um, uh, categorize these things, because it was just starting to kind of move outside the possibility of being able to actually maintain a knowledge of all of these things. And if you wanted to maintain a knowledge of all these things, then what you'd have to do is you'd have to start categorizing. Um, but now, um, as I put before, you know, um, if you wanted to have a relevant handle on you know a reasonable handle on on the relevant corpus inside geometry that would be a challenge that would be a life's work um and i know there are i know some people that that that's their life's work is is just like you know it's almost like catching like catching up let alone contributing you know um uh uh really really so so um what does this mean for future work it's like well Companies in the knowledge economy, especially, are going to be faced with more and more complex problems that the reality is you're never going to have a, a, a small group um, that's going to have the single configuration of all of the specialties. Like we've tried doing it in programming, like DevOps. It's like, yeah, we're going to have whatever. And, and they're already, it's, it's pretty insane, um, which is why I, I, I actually like that they ended up with the term uh, uh, DevOps. Um, like like some sort of special forces team because it's like yeah like you know it's kind of crazy to be able to know everything you know from front end to back end um, and you know you find like companies like Palantir incredibly uh, are, are very impressive in that that respect their ability to form the team around like what what's going to be necessary to given company they're consulting with and that that'll actually come up in a bit so so um, if that's the case that you can never really have one small team that's going to be able to map all of the necessary specialties to handle all the problems that it's going to face. It's like, well, you could increase the number, but then you run into the next challenge, which is the fact we're not really built to work in large numbers horizontally. You know, you, you need, you need some form of hierarchy. Eventually you're going to end up with clicks or, and that's normal. It's a feature, not a bug. Um, we're, we're not built to, to, I don't know, like for listeners, people on this call working in a, a team of seven or more people, um, it's rare that things get done. Usually what ends up happening is this work about work. Um, this is not contentious. So I think everybody kind of knows it's like, you know, and I've seen it on committees where it's, you know, like 30 or 40 people and it's like, all right, like, you know, is this really horizontal? You, you actually need um, some form of hierarchy, hierarchy and, then, and then split it back out to smaller teams. So if you can't increase the number, then really all you're left with is the ability to reconfigure. Um, and, and this is, you know, um, uh, the, so the, the book I, I co-authored, um, uh, which is the great preset, um, it, it was, it was about remote teams and operational art, but the, really the focus underneath it was really emergent teams and, and how they communicate, uh, because this may be the only real answer in the future is the ability to just reconfigure rapidly, or at least the ability to, to have um, these teams 
interface with one another. And I think that's becoming much more commonplace, at least at least in the people I know in industry, it's becoming much more commonplace that you don't just have your team, it's interdepartment. Okay, maybe that was normal 20 years ago, but interdepartment with departments from different companies, that's becoming, I'm noticing that's becoming much more common, especially um, in technology. Um, so for example, like in um, uh, chatbots, good example of that, where it's like, yeah, like, okay, you know, you want to deploy a chatbot. That's not just something you can do as a single team. You're working with the team that uh, if you're going to just focus on the deployment of chatbots, you're, you're not just doing that. You have to work with the client. Um, who has their own media and and public relations teams that have to sign off on on media and art, all of that they have to they have to cooperate and integrate. And then second, you need to operate with with the company on the platform uh, that you're actually going to deploy them on. So you have you have at least you know a, a a triangle of three teams with one of them acting as kind of a liaison between all of it um, that actually has to get work done as well. Um, so, so really, there's, there's, there's this. I, I think it's going to be a, a really important new focus on on both the interfacing between organizations and teams, um, and then uh, how to reconfigure them to make sure that that um, you can kind of hot swap members out when necessary, um, mm-hmm. uh, and and kind of normalizing that process. So as we come out of um, the the COVID crisis, we're not out of it, obviously, but as we we start to come out of it, governments are ramping up investment. Um, and one of the pieces of research that you've done in the past um, has been looking at the relationship between government funding and innovation. It'd be good. I think it's kind of timely that uh, we we just talk to you about that. So there has been, at least I, I interpret it this way, there has been um, a bit of a falling out um, between uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, so I, I can speak to the U.S. specifically in this case, between Silicon Valley and um uh, the the military research apparatus. So that is, you know, um, organizations like the Office of Naval Research, which, you know, um, if you wanted to find, like, map the relationship between our, our modern technology and and as we go through this, it's like ONR, it's like, that's Roger Shank. That's, that, that's they funded the earliest research on AI and, and really, you know, um, uh, moving the needle there on how to, uh, so I think the paper was like a story understander. It was like looking at how to get um, uh, not just AI to, to pattern match, but but to understand stories and, and, and recognize context. Um, then, uh, you know, DARPA, uh, which obviously like, this is where we have, this is where we got the internet, um, you know, uh, self-driving cars. And it, it seems like there's been a, a sort of falling out mostly because um, uh, you see this this next generation of people coming in who aren't working on semiconductors. They're they're working on you know um, platform design, you know, um, and uh, user experience design, and and uh, you know, and code. And and um, I find the ones that recognize, I find the people that that recognize um, this old relationship um, as something that could be stable or or of value, uh, far and few between. So before we come to the end, um, we've been asking this question of a few people who think about what's happening in the world and what the future might lie. So we've asked this question recently of Kevin Kelly, founder of Wired, um, John Gray, the um, economist, um, Will Page, who was until recently the chief economist at Spotify, about what what do you think the next decade holds in terms of the kind of economic, socioeconomic outlook? Are you an optimist? A realist what are you what do you what do you see oh um so it's it's a choice here so i can either i i can either um give um so i could go down one road and and that road would be saying taking a bet on on one of like you know uh, a thousand to one odds in a series of black swan events um that could occur um and and i think that would be more honest the other the other road would be would be giving a, a sort of broad benign outlook on on um are we moving up or down kind of and it would be easier but but it wouldn't be honest so 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 i i i will have to go with the first road which is i, I won't put it as optimist or pessimist or realist i think it it will just be um from a probability standpoint let's call it Um, There are a series of things that have kind of been a series of phenomena that kind of been in waiting things that that come in historical cycles, but but have kind of been disrupted in the last 60 years for a variety of reasons. The first is is kinetic or conventional war. 
Um, I know some people don't like the term kinetic, like hot worth, like uh, um, some people consider it like antiseptic. It's like this, like, you know, like really removed term. Um, but but it's important to differentiate from from other forms of conflict. Um, so so one 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 again, I'm not I'm not saying this is going to happen. I'm, I'm putting it as, as this pool, this common pool of potential black swan events that could occur. Um, we've been waiting for this for a very, very long time, and we have never in the history of modern society successfully predicted um, uh, the breakout of conventional war. It's never happened. It's just it just happens every now and then. And, um, you know, looking at complexity science, it's like, oh, you know, well, there's a certain number of factors that usually are present before before um, some conventional war. And um, there's actually like a whole like subfield in complexity science, which is like, I think it's like just something rough, like complexity history. And it's like looking at like, can you apply the same the same um, logics of how you go about like predicting and forecasting in complex systems to historical events and then like look forward. So So there's a couple of factors present right now um, that are of concern, mostly having to do with with um, uh, I would I would call it China and and, and the United States um, is really the the most risky one, um, especially with with Taiwan being uh, there. Um, and I could go into detail about that um, and why I think that's a possibility. Um, and I understand the rebuttals to it. I get it. Um, but it's in nonetheless in this series of black swan events, in which case we have no idea what look what it looks like after beyond that is strange territory. We have we have no idea what the world looks like if that happens. Um, so then second is um, the potential for um, a uh, truly debilitating um, uh, cyber attack on infrastructure, particularly financial services. Um, that's that's the second one I put in that in that pool. Um, which again, beyond that, strange territory. Um, our, our society is built in a very fragile way. There's, there's a lot of, um, you know, we, we saw this with, I think the, the best example was the Suez Canal not that long ago. And it's like one ship, <laughs> one ship gets stuck the wrong way because of a bad wind and it screwed, it's, it hasn't, you know, the, 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 the impact of that, there's network effects throughout, throughout all of these interconnected economies. We haven't solved that problem yet. Like we're still, you know, even though the ship is righted, it's like we have not solved the, the, over, like the overwhelming effects. It'll be, I think one estimate I saw was like, it'll be another two years before we wow. see like, okay, like a, nor, a, a leveling out of the impacts from that on container prices, all these different things. So, so, so we, we, because everything's working and has been working for so long, like, you know, it's, 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 it's very easy to get complacent and then like, hey, we could, we could see a wrong gust at the wrong time and, and, you know, a metaphoric one this time and, you know, and, and we have no idea what, what things will look like after. So, so that's why I say, I, I, I'm looking at this, at this pool now outside of, of those two, those are the two ones that I would actually consider seriously. There are a variety of others, but um, so, so I will, I will place myself as worried um, but in either case, regardless, I think with with things moving the way they're moving now, um, particularly with with changes um, around uh, um, uh, changes to to both both um, regulations and 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 also yeah, really important, both the UK and the US, is constitutional rights associated with COVID nineteen. We really don't know what these next ten years will look like. Um, it's very very tough to say. Sorry, can I jump in? I want to. I want to hone in on your. You said you know worried is your mm-hmm. is your default now based on everything you said. That's your that's your mindset at the moment. Mm-hmm. So I'm curious in your view, what's the call to action to, con- to confront that from a leadership perspective? De-escalation. Hmm. So right now we're in a very and this is this is this is really um, uh, I, what I would put as that third, but I don't really know how to term it. Really, uh, uh, what what series of events could occur from it? But but um, right now our societies are incredibly polarized. Um, mm-hmm. We're we're failing to communicate and we're failing to get the leadership to kind of like and and I mean that in an abstract sense, both like political leadership. Um, and down to, you know, maybe you could even call it family leadership. Um, uh, the, the ability to, to, to de-escalate a little bit and, and understand where other people are coming from, even if, even if the views that they're coming to the table with feel offensive or terrible, going mm-hmm. both ways. Um, we, we really need, uh, I, think, I think de-escalation is the new form of public service. And, and any leader that, that's going to commit themselves to de-escalation um, within the context of their own teams, their own organizations, it's like it's a recognize it's it's an acknowledgement that right now people feel um, uh, uh, very cautious 
about um, uh, speaking their minds. Um, you know, already in, in the workplace, you already have that asymmetry about kind of worry about what do I say? When do I say it? Um, you know, uh, um, in terms of career advancement and all that stuff. But but this this added pressure that is just ubiquitous now of, of what's going on in the world um, uh, politically, um, health wise, like there's so much happening. I think honestly, the, 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 like it is the new form of public service making, mm. and it's a decision, it's a decision, it's a decision to deescalate and say, okay, well, you know, um, my, and this comes from like, I was looking at emotional regulation for a long time and it's so important. It's like, if I, you know, like you could literally like forget like the casino industry, go look at couples therapy. Like they, like they have that literature on that. It's like, yeah, like, you know, like why, you know, so when I see like, like things kind of falling apart, um, like what's happening on, you know, like what's happening within our society that families are disowning members. And I'm like, like, go like we, why wouldn't it happen? Like with, with the, the context we've created, like go, go look at the couples therapy literature. It's, it's great. You know, mm. <laughs> like, like there's tons of accessible stuff on like de-escalation. It's like, go apply that everywhere. Um, can't, cannot hurt that. you. <laughs> yeah. I love that. I love that. I think that's a, a fantastic place for us to close. Actually. It's a good, good sentiment. Mm. RJ, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Yeah, thank you. Such a pleasure. Thank you, RJ. Yeah, thanks for having me. Until next time, remember the world is evolving. Are you?